My guest on this week's episode of Suds and Search is Dr. Pete Myers, marketing scientist at Moz. Dr. Pete is a legend in the SEO community. He is the creator of MozCast, which operates like a weather report for detecting when Google has made an update to their algorithm. MozCast started in 2012, at the time of some of the most consequential algorithm updates ever. Nine years later, MozCast remains a go-to resource for SEOs who want to learn what might have happened to their rankings and traffic after Google made a tweak to their algorithm. I'm going to start our conversation asking Dr. Pete about MozCast, Google updates generally, and I want to get a sense of how tumultuous the weather has been so far in 2021. Dr. Pete is also a must-read blogger and conference presenter. He is a regular contributor to the Moz blog, and over the course of my career, I can recall more than a few posts going viral on SEO Twitter. I'm going to ask him about one of those posts from a few years ago about HTTPS being mere table stakes. Grab something cold to drink and join me for a conversation with Dr. Pete. We'll chat all about how studying algorithm changes from the past might help SEOs become better predictors in the future. We'll talk about vanity metrics and SEO, and I'll ask him a little bit about the cult movie Bleeding Steel, starring Jackie Chan. All right, Dr. Pete, welcome to Susan Search. How you doing? Good. Nice to be here. I'm jealous of your cocktail. That looks delicious. It looks like a, yeah, a fruit a... punch or something. <laughs> I got a little everything in there. Got some... Uh... Lime, some ginger <laughs> beer, some uh, cherry, and a uh, crack and rum. I've been using for everything, so that's good stuff. Well, you you have now won the award for the most impressive drink made on Suds and Search, so I appreciate that. We won't um, discuss it. It's only uh, two o five here. <laughs> <laughs> we won't discuss it. Yeah, exactly. So, well, well. Anyway, I I have so many things I want to talk to you about. It's a big get for us to have you on. You're the man behind Mozcast which I can remember back in the SEO Moz days when Mozcast got, came out. Um, for, the, for anyone watching who doesn't know, what is Mozcast and what are you tracking there? Yeah, so it, it actually was a bit before Penguin. So I was realizing the other day just how long <laughs> that's been around and wow. dealing with a lull. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we had this idea um, a bit before Penguin, I guess the short version of it is uh, Eric Schmidt had done that testimony in front of Congress and revealed that there were something like 600 algo updates a year. This was back in 2012, 2011. Now there's 3,000 something. And, you know, we were tracking, what, maybe a dozen, two dozen and giving them names. And, you know, we just got thinking about, is there a better way to do this? Could we look at the SERPs, see how much they change day over day and try and measure if something happened that didn't get announced by Google. Uh, and mm -hmm. back then we started with like 50 keywords and it was kind of a lark, like, okay. uh, you know, probably not gonna, <laughs> probably not gonna do right, anything. Right. Uh, and it, it worked and uh, Penguin came along and it, it spiked and we said, wow, that's okay, there's something here. So we started, to, we turned it into a, a site and uh, I can't remember who it was, but somebody else beat us to the punch by like two weeks. So it was like, it was one of those ideas that oh, felt like it was like, in the wind. You know what I mean? Like, oh, this is just something people were thinking about. And then there's been a bunch, you know, SEMrush and a whole bunch of people have versions now. And so, yeah, it's been kind of cool and a lot of data sharing. It's it's evolved. We've looked more now at uh, SERP features and some of that changing landscape, yeah, that's what I was you say. know. Uh, and I think we're yeah. running, I think we run 10,000 now, but we also have the stat data. I got about six million i think serps a day i can dig into so yeah it's become like a whole cottage yeah, uh, I industry <laughs> i hadn't thought about that that, that partnership with stat analytics has got to be huge for you guys so yeah that's um, a big big thing so. well i i will say mozcast often imitated never duplicated it is the the go-to place for these algo updates so uh there's the, the other part of it. There's this weather component to it. So if there's if it's like gets extremely hot or stormy, those are indicators of uh, of major fluctuations in the SERP. Yeah. And so for 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 people like me who just like to are visual learners, this really works well. Um, but you you hit on what I was going to say in my next question, which is that from Penguin to today, one of the biggest changes in terms of volatility on the SERP would have to be all the different search fe SERP features. So, yeah. you know, we're local guys. We really want to know uh, about the propensity of Google to show a map pack or not show a map pack or how that's going. And there are a ton of these things from featured snippets to question and answer boxes and everything. 
is as you think about volatility on the SERP today, is that really where it's coming most? Is it, is it from all these SERP features? Is that, is that what's driving it? Yeah, we don't measure that in terms of the volatility itself. We've kind of separated uh-huh. that out. But I think that's that's really supplanted kind of that core algo volatility in a way. And, and I'll tell you the thing I learned in the first couple of years of measuring this is that SERPs are changing all the time. You know, yeah, Google makes 3,000, whatever they said last year, changes. Some of those are tiny, some that are huge. That's unbelievable. But I know. Millions of pieces of content are being produced today. You know, just the whole landscape changes. Uh, and so what's really interesting to me with SERP features that kind of gets away from that core organic is it used to be that what we looked at is like vertical search was kind of available mm-hmm. to anybody, right? Like any SERP could, could maybe have a video or could have images or could have news and obviously could have ads. And even that, even ads have changed now where Google is really trying to target commercial intent or featured mm-hmm. snippets really seem to be tied to informational intent. And videos are much more likely now on how to, or you know, not just on anything, but where Google thinks a video actually has value. And so it's much more complex and interesting now where the space you're in, some features might not matter at all. And some things might not be changing and some algo updates mm-hmm. might not do anything. And some other thing might be just incredibly important. And so it's it's cool, but it's difficult too. You know, I worked with some people for whom yeah. the uh, the medical knowledge panels, those really rich panels with yeah. the images and curated content, super high impact. I mean, just radically change click throughs overnight, change their whole marketing strategy, and then it's like to ninety nine percent of the rest of the world, they don't matter at all. Yeah. You know, they're so niche. And so it's what's gotten interesting to me is it's a little different for everybody. Like you have to really know what are these three or four core things that really impact you. And like you say, the algo could be moving all over the place or maybe not move at all. But the local pack flips and you're right. a local business and that's all that matters. Right. You know, what everything else did is kind of noise. <laughs> if what matters sure. for you is that pack or what matters for you is that top stories box. Um, yeah, t- totally, totally agree. Um, yeah, you just you got my my curiosity remembering about Penguin. I, I didn't quite realize it has been around that long. Was there a specific day or a specific change that you remember just being like jaw on the ground? I can't believe what Mozcast is doing over a period of time. And it, was, would it have been Penguin or is there a specific yeah, I think day? Pe- that well, you Penguin was the first one that was confirmed that we measured. Uh, and then a few months later, that same year, I don't know, we measured something that we ended up naming. We call it Bigfoot or something, but it was sort of fun just because it was the first thing that we sort of measured that Google didn't announce. Uh, but yeah, Penguin was like just the biggest spike we ever saw in that first five months and kind of that relief of like, oh, hey, you know, maybe this wasn't stupid. <laughs> you know, maybe this wasn't a complete waste of time. Um, Wow. And it's funny that I was uh, I was contract for Moz at the time. And so that kind of actually okay. is what took me full time and spawned wow. everything else. Okay. Well, interesting. Well, I I think it's algorithm changes are just about everybody's favorite topic at conferences. You always hear about these things. Um, I, I heard an interview you did with Barry where I thought you, I'm paraphrasing what you said a little bit. So correct me if I say it wrong. But I, I think you said something like, we chase the algorithm so you don't have to, which I thought was kind of a funny way of putting it. But in, in, in very general terms, how would you say the forecast has been in early 2021? What are we looking at? What, what, where is the landscape today? We saw you know a lot of volatility a couple of years ago, and then it seemed like things settled down a little bit. But I would say, generally speaking, search is more volatile than it was when we started. You know, just the mm. pace of acceleration. Google is, and some of that's Google just trying to compete, right? They're mixing things up. They're trying to improve quality. They're trying to improve clicks on ads and all these things kind of, I'm not saying organic and ads affect each other, <laughs> but obviously yeah, yeah, if you yeah, change yeah. the organic results and you it impacts your ad clicks. And if you change the ad algorithm, it's going to impact some things in organic. It impacts people's overall experience. So I think their, their rate of, acceleration in terms of experimenting and making changes is definitely that's gone up over the well, years so we've we've seen that in flux and it also means that truthfully any given change is 
kind of harder to pin down. You know, there's so much background noise. Right. Uh, and the world moves fast. So, you know, it can be interesting during something like the pandemic. You know, we saw these massive shifts over a few months that had nothing to do, most likely had nothing to do with the algorithm. We think Google probably in one core update tried to adapt to some of those changes, but there were massive changes in search demand for certain things. Yeah. And those changes, I don't want to speculate what's machine learning and what's not, but, you know, as the inputs to the machine changed, the pandemic kind of yeah. reshaped rankings and re reshaped search because people were just searching for completely different things. Uh, yeah. And so it, it was interesting to see a lot of companies that used ML basically have to shut it down or dig in it because the world changed so much that the algorithms were just going nuts. You know, they were trying to like rewrite <laughs> the way they saw the yeah. world. Uh, maybe the algorithms were less crazy than we were, you know, maybe uh, they, <laughs> right, true. Maybe they yeah. were reacting the appropriate amount and we were underreacting. I don't know. But yeah, it's been you an interesting year in that sense, because how do you measure? How do you measure what Google does in the backdrop of the entire world being in crisis? You know? Yeah, yeah. I would think in, in I, I could be off here, but I, I would think that somebody like you who focuses on these changes would have have some insight into what Google is focusing on, sort of the same way that Bill Slosky looks at, you know, at uh, what, what do you call the at uh, patents, patents, I'm sorry, yeah. that, that he looks at patents, you have sort of your finger on the pulse of what's actually happening in real time. And I, I wonder if, if you could tell me you know, any of these recent updates, you've used some of these buzzwords before machine learning, AI, um, now we have core web vitals. What if what have some of these updates taught you about where Google what Google is focusing on here in the near future? I think the big thing I've seen. Well, first, let me say in terms of core web vitals, I think there's certain things Google has learned that it's better to try and do a persuasive PR push than a major <laughs> algorithm update. And we saw that with uh, HTTPS. We saw that with mobile. I think we're seeing that with Core Web Vitals. You know, they want our sites right. to be faster and perform better. We should want that. We can argue about whether Core Web Vitals are the right metrics or whether they're flawed or not, but we should want our sites to be faster and perform better. And so, you know, my opinion is those first couple of updates, they're probably not going to change the things that mm. much. You know, I don't think Google can afford the collateral damage. So right now they're just trying to get it out there and say, hey, Go do this, <laughs> you know, Makes sense. go yeah. do this or we might we might mess with you if you don't. But yeah, I think it's just it's a strong hint. You know, when they come out and say anytime they come out and say an update's coming in six months, you know, it yes. doesn't get any clearer than this is what we think you ought to do. Well, I, I can think of something that is similar. So in 2017, you wrote a blog post where you said 50 percent of the pay, of page one results on Google are using HTTPS, that this was a clear sign from Google that this is where they wanted you to go. And I remember that post being in every conference presentation. It was all over Twitter. Um, it, it was very important. You recently updated it. What does the data look like now in terms of HTTPS and whether or not this may, may be table stakes? Yeah, I want to say it's something like 97 percent now i'd have to <laughs> yeah it, <laughs> it's close to 100 yeah 98.3 percent today um uh, and we looked at some yeah. bigger data sets and the same thing yeah at this point it's it's done uh, and it was slow i mean i think that initial algo update google didn't hit as hard as we feared they might right they they knew that a lot of big sites hadn't moved uh but they were signaling that this is what was going to happen over the couple of years after that. And that's what happened. Uh, and yeah, now if, and now if you're not there, you know, I don't know, what are you doing? Yeah. It's like the anti-play the write game. About it so. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like you're it. not there. I'm not, can't help you really. I dig it. All right. Well, I wanted to ask you about a blog post that you wrote recently. Uh, it's titled long tail SEO in 2021. How can you have it all or die trying? I loved something you did in this blog post where there's an article, there's a paragraph and the heading says, the long tail is exploding. Then the next paragraph, 
the heading says the long tail is imploding. What gives here? What what do you, what do you make of the long tail in 2021? <laughs> well, you, you, got, <laughs> you got past chunky thorax. So thank you. For I did reading. get chunky. Thank chunky you for thorax. reading past <laughs> that graph. <clears throat> I think I, I did, was a yes. victim of my own joke there. That was that was like 98% of what went on the web. Yeah, so it's really interesting to me. We've been measuring lately uh, due to some product research that isn't ready to talk about yet, unfortunately, <laughs> um, various measures of SERP similarity. And the idea is if Google, if there are two phrases that seem different, but they generate the exact same first page of results, it's probably not a coincidence, right? Google sees that as somewhat being equivalent. And as we've done dug into that, you know, there's this acknowledgement in SEO that with natural language, post hummingbird, uh, not necessarily saying voice, but voice drove it to some degree. People are querying longer searches. They're using more words. They're, you know, what's Google's ongoing stat? We always hear 15% a day. 15% are yeah. things they've never seen before. And, you know, usually it's not some word we made up. It's some super long natural language variant of the same thing. And so from an SEO perspective, we can look at that and go, you know, gee, I used to just have to target like local SEO or web design in Chicago. And now it's like, how much does a web designer cost and how long does a normal project take in June? You know, right. how the hell am I going to target? Do I have to write a blog post for every single one of those? And so I think NLP has made us more comfortable with natural language, mm. which is exploding the long tail. Mm. But NLP also understands that 118 variations of that question are essentially the same and mm. returns all the same results. Mm. And so the message I wanted to push in the post and the thing we're seeing more and more is, you know, the things we used to worry about, like plurals or stemming or, yeah. you know, like I just did a post on long tail SEO, like you mentioned, with I I use that as a backdrop for an experiment that I'm talking about at MozCon. But stuff like whether long tail has a hyphen or not, or is two words or one word, right? <laughs> almost doesn't matter in 2021. You don't have to target all those things. Google yeah. isn't even going to return two sets of results. They're just going to say showing results for and maybe not even say it. You know, yeah. I was doing a bunch of searches around long tail SEO. And depending on how I searched, the entire first page was matching on long tail keywords. I mean, the mm. phrase long tail keywords didn't even have SEO in the title because Google's just saying, you know what? This is the same. This is the same intent. Uh, wow. And so I think the the freeing part of that in a way is we don't have to get hung up on, you know, I don't have to write long tail SEO, long dash tail SEO, long tail one word SEO, keywords, keywords, mm. keywords, 2021. <laughs> you know, and this, yes. That kind of keyword stuffing and it's not just it's not just not necessary it's it's counterproductive you know google gets right. it though those things are the same and so i think the trick for us is knowing when they're the same and when they're not because there are going to be instances where because of search volume or because of some trend you know adding an s makes a huge difference and 95 mm. percent of the time it won't matter at all and so i think what's going to be a really interesting problem for us in seo is measuring that kind of clustering those keywords together and understanding that look if i write this piece of content that's really targeting these hundred things that i'm interested in and instead of having a giant spreadsheet of keywords really what i'm looking at is kind of 10 or 20 or 30 concepts and how do i measure that and how do i see how google measures that similarity uh and not you know, I think it's super interesting to study NLP and look at BERT and mm -hmm. all these algos and where they're headed. But there's also kind of a gap between the things Google could do in academic computer science and what Google's actually doing today. And right. so we're trying to understand like, OK, we can read the papers and get where they're headed. And that's important. But we want to know what they're actually capable of and what what keywords are basically the same because if you know that these two things are the same then you don't have to worry about it right you can pick one and move on with your right. life and so i think that's going to be critically important for seo in the next few years is looking mm. at keyword research as being conceptual and as really understanding what google equates uh, and that's evolved just incredibly in the last five years with nlp
Amazing. Well, I, I'll link to the blog post, and I encourage anybody to check it out, especially if you want to know what chunky thorax means. <laughs> what, what Keep Dr. reading. So I actually would love to hear what people think of the part at the end. We did some measurements of similarity and kind of trying to chart like, hey, if I got these 10 keywords, how far apart are they really? Uh, and I think that's where our tools are headed. Uh, and we're, yeah. you know, we're excited to explore some of that. All right. Well, I, I want to I want to touch on just a couple of other things here real quick. One was a, a whiteboard Friday that you did. I really want to compliment Maz on how they've been able to do these whiteboard Fridays from home. So people don't have to come into Seattle now. So Greg's been able to do one. My friend, uh, my friends who've been on the show have been able to do them. But yours was about every metric is a vanity metric. This is good timing because just this week, Greg wrote a Greg had a video about keyword rankings and how these are a vanity metric and how they're not really telling you the right things. You mentioned keyword rankings, but you even go a step further and say that, you know, things like sales, things like lifetime value of a customer, these can become vanity metrics if they're not put in the right context. Um, to set the table for this, how, how could a metric like sales or, uh, you know, customer lifetime value be a vanity metric? How, how did you how did you mean that? I want to make sure I don't mis misstate it. Yeah, people get a little jumpy about <laughs> that one. I, I, want to, I want to say first that it's not my point that everything's the same. You know, we don't yeah. we don't measure hits anymore, right? Uh, I, I don't care that that's a good one. Yeah. things loaded, and in fact, it's probably a bad sign for your yeah. site if uh, a page is loading a ton of stuff. So I don't want to say that they're all exactly the same. Obviously, we care about the bottom line. Uh, there's two arguments I'll make. One is a story that uh, I can't actually tell the actual story because i'd get a company in trouble but essentially a story uh from someone i'm close to about their employer where they had a, a one-off positive thing that happened uh that we know will never happen again and it, it was a huge boost mm -hmm. in revenue and they were sitting in their board meeting and they were mm -hmm. using that happening to project next year right yeah. And someone in the board is basically saying, we know that was a fluke, right? We know that is never going right. to happen again. Yeah. How can you possibly? But because they were so entranced with that number and baked it in, they really put themselves in incredible danger, right? Like of not meeting that target of hiring and spending and matching against where they were headed. Now, does that mean that that money was bad or fake? No, I'd rather have that money than... A million mm -hmm. tweets or likes or you know <laughs> or whatever else right so you know i'm not going to say that i don't want the money but because they were so laser focused on that and kind of celebrating and going hey hurry for us uh they missed something really vital that really could have damaged their company if they had used that to make their projections and chart their spending and all that um mm. The thing I'll say about rankings is this, and obviously we have a rank tracking tool, so you know I'm, you can call me True. biased if you want. But let's yeah. say my, my leads drop, and I can't measure up that funnel. Yes. You know, I don't know, did my traffic drop? Did my conversion rate drop? Let's say my traffic drop. Where did the traffic drop come from? Well, if it's search, then ultimately it came from some keyword Yes, I think any given specific ranking is less important than it once was. And I don't think we should obsess about any given specific ranking. But if it was traffic from search, then it came from keywords that were ranking. Because that's all we got, right? <laughs> now, you know, it could come from the local pack or it could come from top stories or other things, right? You know, it, it's, it's complicated, but it, I must have appeared on that page. Yeah. And so if all I know is my sales dropped, and I can't go back up that chain of events. Right. I don't know why. I don't know how to fix it. And so that's a really yeah. critical thing to me. The thing we don't ever talk about that I kind of raised really briefly is the opposite end. And we're almost worse about this. If things go up and I go, hey, we did a great job. Congratulations, team. <laughs> how do I do it again? Yes. You know, why did they go up? And if I can really understand what went up and what drove that, and that, again, is going to come down to traffic and keywords and this whole chain of events, then I can replicate success. And we are not good yes. at that in marketing, I find. You know, we are not, we are good at 
those one-offs and we have an intuition, you know, I'm not saying people aren't good at marketing. You know, we have an intuition for maybe what'll work, but when things work and we celebrate, there's a real what's next kind of yes. thing. Being able to dig back into that chain of events that led to success or failure, I think is really important. Now, if I look at that whole chain and I said, if I had to pick one, would I pick dollars or rankings? Yeah, I'm going to pick the dollars, you know, no right. question. But but I think there can be a real tunnel vision of just saying, oh, I'm only focused on sales. I don't care about that. Well, where did your sales come from? Yeah. You know, because there was a whole bunch of that, stuff that happened <laughs> before you sold that, anything, right? Yeah. That last portion, you talk, there are like three R's that you talk about. There's the repair and replication. And I think the other one was I think I tried, R, really, but yeah. I tried really hard to get three <laughs> R's and I don't even remember what they all were. Yeah. But but certainly it makes perfect sense, right? So if you see something at the bottom of your funnel, not cooperating or maybe doing really well, you need to look towards the top to explain it and to, to make more sense of it. So I, I think, I, again, I'll, I'll link to this one as well in the show notes. Uh, this, this, it's a great, it's a great uh, post and I love it. The, the last Dr. Pete post I want to talk to you about is one that's titled SEO is not an on off switch. I'm glad I don't go. So there's these, something. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It really. Uh, I know. Hit me with I, all. I, I, I try. Yeah. So um, there's something interesting going on in our world right now. We work with a lot of auto dealerships. There is a chip shortage. So there's less inventory for automobile dealers. And so they, the, the question may become like, well, why don't we just like turn off SEO for a little while until we have mm -hmm. more more uh, automobiles on our on our new lot um you know you've compared this to exercise and they've you you know you, you've got to keep doing it all the time but what should these auto dealers know about turning off their seo from dr pete yeah again obviously we're in this business so it's sometimes <laughs> hard to be completely objective but the that piece was in the context of the pandemic where we see the same thing you know mm -hmm. people right People naturally had to shut down. Local businesses, of course, uh, totally get that. You know, that was disastrous for some folks. And obviously the automotive industry has had their own impact in that sense too. Um, I think the challenge is, you know, I contrasted PPC and organic. And I used to do PPC work. And so this is not a bad or good comparison. But the thing about PPC is, the thing that's great about it is you turn it on it starts generating leads that day. Right. If you no, obviously you yes. improve and it's incremental, but if we're really oversimplifying, you turn it on, the leads come. Mm -hmm. The double-edged sword of that is when you turn it off, the leads are gone yeah. that day. Yeah. Organic takes time to ramp up. And the positive of that is that when you shut it off, it's actually going to take time to ramp down. But I think the challenge is for us, first of all, that leads to kind of some false, some kind of false attribution. Like you go, oh, well, we're still getting leads. Maybe our SEO wasn't really doing that much. Yeah, you, know, you right. get into kind of right, a, right. you think the gains are magic once that flywheel is coming. Yes. And if it takes two or three months for that to ramp back down, you might not realize that you're losing, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, right. you shut off the paid ads and the leads dry up and you know what happened, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know you yeah. know the next day. You shut up your right. organic, you might get into that kind of false hope. And I think that's where you said I was comparing it to exercise, right? Like you, yeah. you stop doing it, you still feel okay, right? It's yeah. like a month later where you're sitting around going, right. oh man, I, I really feel like I'm 50 and if I stop doing it, I really feel like crap, you know, like what, what happened? Like, oh yeah, maybe I haven't been exercising for a month. And so, you know, I, I think that's the first danger that, that false sense of, oh, I SEO'd my site, you know, I'm, I'm done. I, yes, I did right, my right. SEO and it's all great and that's it. Well, yeah, it's an investment and it, it returns dividends and that's a cool thing about SEO, but it's not going to last, right? Um, yes. The other side of it, and this is where I worry about businesses reopening or like your example with the chips, eventually the chips, I hope, will come back. You know, eventually inventory will be restored. Now, if on that day or you hear that next Tuesday you're going to get stuff back in stock and I know with auto dealerships, I assume that 
because it's controlled by the manufacturers, they might not get that. They're not going to get a six month lead time on when are the cars coming back to the lot or when are the right. new models coming out? You know, they might not know that as soon as they'd like. If you then go, okay, we can ramp back spin. Now you're on another two to three or six month cycle yeah, right. to get back where you were. And so if you don't, and I obviously in the pandemic is a different issue because if the money's not there, it's not there. But I think you have to be thinking about how do you get ahead of that? Yeah, you know, it's one I, thing. I, I, it's one thing to scale back. I get that that can be necessary sometimes, but you can't just sit there and go, "We're just going to turn it back on when things improve," because you're going to hit a three month lag time where you're losing out. Right. So I, I worry I about get that. It. Well, great. Well, you've been very generous with your time while I've gone through everything you've written in the last year. I'm obviously a big fan. Uh, I, I wanted to make sure I got I to. <laughs> I wanted to get to everyone's favorite part of the show, which is Greg's no context questions. So this is where he'll send me, you know, a few words, maybe maybe two or three words. Oh my God. And I don't know anything more about it than that. And, you know, so it's a little bit of a highway rack for both of us. For you, he has... Garage in a spaceship. Does that mean anything to you? <laughs> yeah, yes. You, if you're listening to this and you have not watched Jackie Chan's Bleeding Steel, you need to do that. And if you've ever wondered right. how to park an SUV on a Star Destroyer, the movie will answer that <laughs> question for you. All right, it's what amazing. is the movie again? I've never I've never seen this. It's so called I'll Bleeding to, Steel. Get... It's a Jackie Chan movie. It is a... Um, it's a buddy cop vampire space kung fu movie. Uh, there's some magic. Every, there's, some, there's like a Chris Angel a magician guy. Uh, it's got everything. It's amazing. I can't think of how many more words you could have said that I liked. So that you'll, great. you'll love it or be wrong. One of those. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's well, view. Dr. Pete, thank you so much for coming on. I, I, obviously, I'm, I'm a big fan of yours and have been for a long time. So it's a big get to have you on Suds and Search. Uh, I'm going to sign off now, but let's do a virtual cheers, and I'll see everybody next week on Suds and Search. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Take care. Thanks.